Welcome to the Art Studio Insights Podcast, where we demystify the creative process and exchange ideas with career-minded artists. We are your hosts, Adriana May and Jackie Sanders. We're two emerging artists sharing for the advice and business lessons we have learned along our journey. So if you're not already, please go ahead and subscribe. This will help other creatives like you find our podcast and you will be notified when we launch a new episode every week. On today's episode, we are going to be discussing, uh, as an artist, um, whether or not you are treating your art as a hobby or as a business or even just as a professional endeavor. So there are different kinds of artists, of course, and different commitment levels that generally come with that. So we have, say, on the ground level, where we all start at some point or another. Yes. <laughs> hobbyist or enthusiast level, uh, which some of these, by the way, we're taking from the uh, career business path or creative business path that we have with our level up artists um, that we work with, of course. But just to kind of give you an idea of the levels that we look at, there was the hobbyist uh, enthusiast. We have emerging artists. There's intermediate or mid-level. Then you have established and then a top yeah, the top uh, side of it, you have the boss level. So depending, of course, where you are in your artist career is where you may find yourself. However, it is possible, even if you're a little bit more advanced, say, on the art side of things, um, you might be in an intermediate level, right, with the art side in terms of the production itself. There might be things that you may be doing that might be more like what a hobbyist might do or someone that's still in the emergent stage might do. And that's totally fine. But that's kind of what we want to discuss today. Yeah, exactly. And as you touched on, Adriana, like everyone starts at the hobbyist level. You have some creative intrigue. And so today we really want to kind of unpack what are those factors that distinguish a hobbyist from an emerging or intermediate artist? Because like you said, I feel like a lot of the time we may think that we are growing our art business or we have the intention of doing that. But really taking a look at what are those key differentiating factors? It may be a tough love moment for some artists realizing things that they may think that they're doing but might not be going full throttle on or be more empowering in terms of giving yourself credit for the energy that you are putting into your business. So really talking about all these different factors that can influence both your work, growing your audience base, as well as professional development as you scale up in the art world and transition from taking your artwork as a hobby into an emerging or an immediate business as an artist. So without further ado, let's go ahead and dive in into what some of the differentiating factors are that dis distinguish a hobbyist and or enthusiast and an artist that is uh, treating their practice as a professional business endeavor. Yeah. So I think the first thing that I always think about and kind of where um, I got started when thinking about, okay, I like this as a hobby. I want to spend time on it. What do I have to do to make it a business? The first thing that I think about is really the number of hours that I commit to the actual artwork itself. How many pieces am I going to produce? What does that tracking schedule look like? And also realistically sales. So how many sales am I making? Am I showing online? Am I showing in a gallery? And what do those factors look like? Because of course, being a hobbyist can be great in terms of making gifts for family members or just exploring um, different types of artwork. But then, okay, how many actual hours am I spending in my studio itself is a huge differentiator, I think, between a hobbyist and an emerging artist. Yeah. And with that, I would bring up too, there's this uh, kind of a pervasive misconception uh, with a lot of artists that think they have to be full time to be considered working professional artists as opposed to hobbyists. Yeah. Um, but that's actually not the case. There are plenty of professional artists that hold other jobs at the same time. And that doesn't mean they don't devote all the necessary time. It also depends what their process looks like, um, right. especially if there's a lot of waiting time in between different stages of their work or their creative flow where it is okay for them to have other jobs. So that's not a prerequisite um, for sure. Mm -hmm. And then with that comes with the number of sale, uh, number of pieces, like you mentioned, production, if you will. Um, it's also important to then know, you know, some artists are not necessarily going to create a big volume of work, but right. if you're treating it as, I don't know when I say you, you might not be <laughs> listening right now. Might be somebody yeah, the listeners. Yeah, you, how dare you? I'm kidding. Um, but essentially, like, is if as an artist, you just sporadically paint, right? Or whatever your right. creative output is, 
And you don't have the self-discipline to say, no, this is more or less what I want to create. Again, you don't want to put too much stress on it either, but so that it constrains your creative process, but have some sort of parameter and some of that self-discipline to actually do it and not just, oh, I did one, like three paintings in a year because I was bored and I was on vacation and that was the end of it. Then that's one of those where it's like, okay, then that's definitely more hobby level. Because if a gallery was like, can you produce for us, you know, working together, if you say I only make three a year, they might be like, no, (laughs) but it's not enough. (laughs) Like there's other things involved. (laughs) Yeah. And I think that's a big hurdle when you first start one, making the decision that you want to treat your art practice like a business, but then actually what are those tangible steps that you need to take? Because we're going to preface this conversation with (laughs) there is absolutely nothing wrong with being a hobby artist. There is nothing wrong with just diving into your creative practice, making pieces that you love for the people that you love, giving them away as gifts. It's like such a productive, fulfilling way to spend your time. Everyone has different activities that they have as hobbies. And if making your art is that, that's amazing. Um, But if you are looking to make it either one day your full-time income or just a very sizable side income or just some type of business goals with your work, then that's the factors that we're thinking about now. Um, And I think you're, you kind of hit the nail on the head with the idea of being full-time in your business. Cause that, as I've shared on the podcast in the past was a huge thing that I used to struggle with thinking that, Oh, well, I can't be a real artist quote unquote, (laughs) if I'm not full-time. And almost feeling initially bad about myself for having a day job when, as I've shared on the podcast before, I was like, I love being able to balance both. Do I have the intention one day to ideally make my art business, my full-time income? Absolutely. But there are also pros and cons to both of those things. And so really managing, okay, number of hours spent in your art business and art making process, even if it just becomes that conscious discipline is I think what can distinguish between a hobbyist and an emerging artist um, who's looking to build their business. Because it doesn't necessarily have to be 40 hours a week every week. It could be, okay, Monday nights and Thursday nights, I am going to be in my studio or in my workstation for three hours every week. That's what it looks like or whatever your schedule is. Um, But I think just like the consciousness of dedicating time towards that practice is kind of what sets apart a hobbyist from emerging in terms of pushing through the times where you might not feel inspired or not might not feel like you want to do it, but because it's a business and you are the owner of that business, you wouldn't just tell your day job employee, oh, you know, like I'm not feeling motivated today. I'm just not going to work. That probably won't end up too well. Like then treating your art business in that same discipline way um, is a huge step. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, like I said, it's definitely one of those. It doesn't have to be a ton of hours. It doesn't have to be a ton of work, but there definitely has to be commitment, which actually leads us to the next uh, next uh, differentiator to think about. And it's in terms of your creative practice itself. So it's that commitment to basically trying to find a specific style or perhaps process, uh, you know, trying to figure out what your authentic voice and message is. Like if you're a hobbyist and you follow a YouTube tutorial, which nothing wrong with that, by the way, whether you're a professional too, you follow a YouTube tutorial. Yeah. But <laughs> if you do it, tutorials are always fun, no matter what level okay, you're We at. all learn <laughs> from others. So it is what it is. But it's kind of like, if you're just doing, I'm going to paint a flower today because it's fun. I'm going to paint a dog tomorrow because it's fun. And it's all in different mediums, different styles. There's nothing wrong with that. However, It turns into what do you actually as an artist want to express versus what these other folks through their tutorials, they're expressing themselves and you're basically mirroring in a way or trying to reflect what they're expressing. That's not your message. That's their message. So it's kind of like, how do you, how do you commit yourself through your creative practice to be able to say, no, this is the message I want to put forth, whatever that looks like. And in order to do so, I also have to be committed to developing my technical artistic abilities so that these things that I'm picturing, you know, in my mind and my soul, my heart, whatever you want to, however you want to call that, these ideas that I want to bring forth through the canvas come to life. And actually the output looks the way that I envision it. Well, you have to work on your style. You have to work on your process. You have to work on techniques. It's not just, you know, again, following somebody else's stuff, which again, 
we all learn. We have, we all have teachers and professors and books and all those things yeah. and our time in the studio. But it's trying to say like, I have to narrow some of this down and how do I make it me, authentically me and make it look the way I want it to. Yeah, and I think that's one thing that, especially as you're trying to find that voice and figure out what you want to say, Sometimes you may think that you're saying one thing when you really want to say something else. And I found that, especially with our level of artist members, um, when we really started diving into the artist statement, which I know we've talked about on past podcast episodes as well, of like uh, sitting down and writing your artist statement. What is your work about? What are you looking to explore? And it doesn't even all have to be conceptual ideas. It could be you want to explore the difference between certain materials and the relationship between them. That's a whole rabbit hole conversation that we can go down <laughs> about like writing an artist statement. But I think almost if you were to try to write one, when you first start, that can kind of lead a path to the work that you want to explore, or it might show you just how clear or unclear your own artist's message and artist's voice is, and can be a great indicator that you may need to spend more time fine tuning that authentic voice and message because everyone has an amazing point of view of the world, a unique point of view and something that they can share. And so as artists, that voice, just like everyone's perspective of the world, it is so personal to you. And so like you were saying, tutorials are great. Learning different techniques is always required to make those visions come to life. But what is your drive for making this work? What message do you want to share with the world? What do you want to be known for? All those things, I think, is something that really does distinguish an art business from a hobby. But also, in addition to finding your creative voice, there are some legal logistic things that really do distinguish between a hobbyist and a business, and that is actually legally filing as a business. And so this is a step that makes a lot of artists uncomfortable, especially in the beginning. You kind of feel like a fish out of water. We've all been there. But legally filing as a business, starting to pay taxes. Um, and I think with that also really taking that admin back end side, the maybe not so glamorous side of the creative business side, um, really seriously of what do your income streams look like? What are your goals financially? Paying taxes every quarter, paying but yeah, legally filing as a business. These are all things that really do distinguish and kind of put that official, I'm officially, officially a business stamp of approval onto your hobby that you want to start growing. Yeah. And it's actually, uh, yeah, it's really funny that you're mentioning the cringing part because a lot of people do. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of decisions to be made regarding this. Are you going to be a sole proprietor? Are you going to establish an LLC? Um, I mean, and with it, it comes also realization, which actually ties into, you know, some of the previous points we've been touching on, that if you choose to go from a hobbyist into an actual working professional artist that's trying to make some wow. income out of their work, you're not going to paint all the time. I mean, uh, right. we can talk about this in a future podcast episode, I'm sure, of what that breakdown looks like, but it also turns into you are giving up some of that perhaps painting time, especially if you are juggling family and other job, et cetera. Yeah. Some of that available painting time that you would have just to do that. Now you're going to have to split up that time between painting and then the admin side of it, as, as we're calling it. So yeah. it's like responding to emails, doing listings, uh, doing your social media. I mean, it just goes into all of that, but basically it's a balance. It's a juggle. Yeah. Um, we do our best, obviously, to balance all the things without getting um, burnt out or too overwhelmed. But doing some of these legal things, at least it's almost as a indicator if for nothing else for your own brain to say, like, this is it. We're going serious. Uh, we're And it doesn't have to be very expensive, by the way, to get started, especially right. with sole proprietor in the U.S., very, very easy to do. But it's that like official step of like, okay, we're doing this. So for a lot of people, uh, some of our members we've talked to, it's like, that's the step that makes them feel official. Like this is it, we're doing it. Right. And exactly. And I think that's definitely a thing in a past episode, we talked about like artist stereotypes where, yeah, it can sometimes, especially with social media these days, it feels like, oh, wow, it must be so nice. You just get to like paint all day and then uh -oh. these things 
these things magically just show up on your website and the listing shop like is magically all perfectly up to date with accurate information. And like, it's really one of those steps of, okay, well, if you're really going to be looking to make sales, you have to pay sales tax on them. If you Mm -hmm. sell a painting for like 40 bucks here or there to family members and they just give you cash, you can get away with that. But up to a certain point. And then the rest will charge you. (laughs) But like, it's one of those, if you want to scale in any capacity, cover your basis. Even if you feel like it's not a significant amount of money, it's always better to file it and be legit. Tax, get legit. Um, and it, yeah, it can be intimidating, but it's also super liberating and rewarding too. I found it was a super empowering declaration because you don't even necessarily have to make a big deal of it if you don't want in terms of like telling family and friends or the world on social media. Um, but it kind of is a cool step in your um, creative growth of really s- declaring, okay, I'm not just going to say that this is a priority. It legally is a priority now. Um, and I don't know, it's a really cool feeling and it kind of takes everything to the next level. Yeah, it does. Um, and speaking of next level, <laughs> um, one of the things too, that differentiates say, you know, a person that's at the hobby level to someone that's taking it a little bit more seriously is that once you know, you've done the legal stuff, you're figuring out your creative practice, what your style looks like, you know, you have basically that commitment, you know, to show up and produce, right? Right. Um, Then at that point, now you have this inventory, then you start looking for exposure opportunities. So where is this work going to be at? Because you can't just hoard it all in your house. Um, (laughs) It needs (laughs) to go out into the world. Um, So how are you going to show it? How are you going to get eyeballs on your work? And of course, you know, for sales. how are you going to gain the trust of an audience and collectors? Uh, how are you going to market and brand yourself? Which I know is scary, but we do have episodes about branding. It's about yeah. telling your story your way instead of somebody telling it for you. So not yeah. that scary. Um, <laughs> and then about having, say, having a, a hub of the, you know, in the world, in the online world, et cetera, and actually putting together a serious or professional like website um, where you're kind of, you know, talking about yourself, you know, a little about me, an artist statement, your work, perhaps uh, an area where you have your artwork for sale and people can go ahead and buy it right off of your website or it links to where they can get it or what galleries, et cetera. But it's basically going from, I mean, we've kind of, you know, shared this with you kind of like the different steps of the process, but it's, it's now putting it out there and finding the people that actually connect, resonate with your work, that actually you know, you're, you're throwing, you're, you're putting your authentic voice and your message through that work. And now you're finding the people that actually can grasp what's in that work and like connect with it. And then they just gravitate towards it. And literally they want to give you money for this beautiful work that you're creating. So yeah, it's, yeah, it's super, it's super rewarding. (laughs) Yeah. And I think that's definitely, again, when thinking about all these different categories, the like artwork logistics step, the creative practice step, those can be all things that you do internally or on a personal, how you spend your time level that isn't necessarily presented to the world. The legal business officially filing as a business is kind of like that official declaration between you and the state and national government. But then also the growth opportunities that can feel a little intimidating because it is talking to your future collectors. It's telling people that like, hey, family, friends, supporters, this is something that's important to me. And it can feel scary simply from those internal voices in your head. It can feel apprehensive because up until this point, you may not have gotten any feedback on what your business or what your artwork structure is. And so you are kind of opening yourself up to feedback, good and bad. But honestly, I feel like, at least from our experiences and the artists in our level of artist membership, it can be apprehensive at first because all these self-doubt thoughts are in your head, but I've gotten nothing but positive feedback. Like in terms of people being excited about the work, wanting to learn more. And like you were saying, that can kind of really help build that momentum of wanting to share more of it, wanting to get more people to see it and to have future collectors give your artwork new and loving homes that they can enjoy. So in a sense, it's kind of like giving a little piece of your like family away or like 
having your creative work go out into the world to be like, okay, bye. Like I might not ever see you again. It's, it's been fun making you. And now you're just off in the world. Like, please take care of it. So it can be like, it's a weird step in the creative business, but it's also a super, super rewarding one. I know you just reminded me of something speaking of giving it away. Um, so depending where you are in your stage, you may or may not have gone through this. I know I did. I used to give away work for free. Um, and the hardest part about that, if you're making artwork that you give away for gifts or anniversaries or events or things like that to family and loved ones, not saying you can't in the future, but one thing that does get tough is creating that expectation. So what ends up happening is as you create your professional business and you're presenting yourself as a professional artist, uh, you may encounter that some people expect to continue to receive things for free which is very challenging because they might point at something and be like, I want that. And you go, that's uh, $1,200. Uh, I can't give it to you for free. I love you. Um, right. So something that I encountered that was a little challenging as I transitioned from that hobbyist stage into emerging was having to cut people off and basically say, I'll make something for you if I choose to, right? And I'm going to give you something else if you want to buy it. Uh, I'm happy to give you a family and friends discount discussion for another day up to whatever right. percentage you feel comfortable with, if you even want to give them a discount. Um, because at the end of the day, all those hours that you spent doing it, that might not that might not add up to the value of what you wanted to give that person, right? Right. And that's a twenty dollar gift kind of person <laughs> or event, and they're pointing at a $1,200 painting, there's a little bit of a disconnect right? Um, in terms of hours, effort, and possibly you paying studio rent or materials or things like that. So that's one thing I just, sorry, I'm like, when you were talking about well, giving yeah. stuff away, it just kind of popped in my head of that's another very, I feel like a good differentiator too, because once you step into that professional level, then you can, you can talk to you know, those folks in your life that are expecting this and basically say, look, let me tell you about how many hours I put into this and how many days and the materials and like all the blood, sweat and tears yeah. that went into it. This is why I'd love to make you something. I can yeah. make something specific. Hey, maybe I can do a commission. Hello. Right. Give it away for free. Yeah. And honestly, I personally never was in that position. I'm very thankful for that. But I know so many artists are. And one thing when I, in the past, was working at a gallery, I kind of picked up, um, I was a registrar at a gallery here in Raleigh. Um, and one thing learning from the woman that ran it, I thought was super awesome in terms of whenever people would ask for a discount, if you weren't comfortable giving one, um, which again, that's a personal choice. Every business has their own um, has their own policy in terms of how much they're willing to give or to who. Um, one thing that they said, which is kind of an easy way to kind of um, neutralize the conversation and have it so people don't take it personally is that, well, if I do provide a substantial discount that would potentially devalue the work in my current collector's eyes, and I owe it to them to keep the value of that artwork. And another thing, especially if someone asks you to like donate something or make something for free, like you said, then really positioning it in, yes, if you want to make something for free for them, great. That's almost like a non-business uh, product. It's just like you person to person product. Or if you want to donate a piece for a cause or a charity that you support a hundred percent, that's a conscious decision that you can make. But if it isn't something that you are comfortable with being able to say, you know what, I would love to support you, but I really can't afford to take the day off right now. Because that's basically what they're asking you to do is to make something without any financial gain to where it's like, well, this painting may have taken me four days of eight hour painting sessions. Mm -hmm. And by you asking for it for free, you're basically asking me to work four days without pay. And I, fi I can't financially afford to take off four days right now. And I think when people, when you position it that way, people, it kind of like puts it into the layman's terms of like comparing it to a normal nine to five job of like, do you understand what you're really asking me right now? Mm -hmm. um, because artwork can be such an uplifting, positive, engaging um, industry, which is amazing. And you can connect with so many people, but I think there's also that element of, oh, well, you can just make more artwork, which is true, but it's not the same. Like people wouldn't go into Target and just say, okay, can I just have these three things for free? 
Like they wouldn't, they wouldn't ask that. So if someone has tried. conversation. Yeah. But I'm um, being able to approach those conversations, which I think also is helpful. Once you start making the choice to treat it like a business, it kind of gives you more um, power in a way to talk as a business. You are a brand. You're not just going to give pieces away for free, which can be harder when you are quote unquote, just a hobbyist or not charging sometimes, but not charging other times. It's almost easier to just cross the board blanket, make, what are your business policies for discounts and giving away work? And there might be situations where you're okay with it, but understanding what are those lines um, is a great way in terms of um, distinguishing between where you are in your creative business. So with all that, our you know biggest takeaway here is to say, whatever stage you feel like you're in, in, you know, your creative career, right? Um, you just want to go ahead and identify where you are now. And then based on what your goals are, which for some people may be to stay hobbyist. And there's, again, absolutely nothing wrong with that. And that is great. And that's lovely. And keep going. And we're rooting for you, right? <laughs> um, but for those of you that say, no, I actually want to move past that and try to at least get some income out of it, perhaps even turn it into a full-time endeavor at some point, then our biggest suggestion is to, once you assess where you are in the, in the creative career, if you will, is to make a plan for which of these different elements we've been talking about you want to spend more time on and start evolving and move forward with. So one step at a time. But with that, we're going to go ahead and wrap up this episode. And we really hope you enjoyed this conversation. As always, both of our blogs will be linked in today's show notes where you can find episode notes, as well as a PDF listing all of these differentiators between a hobby artist and an emerging business. So if you're looking to compare or decide which of these are your main focuses moving forward, go ahead to either one of our blogs and you can download that free PDF. Absolutely. And if you want to stay connected with us in between episodes, share what you have learned, maybe you have another differentiator uh, that you want to add to the list. Uh, you can definitely connect with us on social media. I'm at Amay Art across all platforms. And I'm at Jay Sanders Studio on all platforms. Thank you so much for listening. We'll talk to you next week.